right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Nick. Oh, hey, man. Nick. Thanks for joining jo- joining us in our comic book coffee break. I'm just uh, I'm just playing a vintage handheld X Men game purchased for me by my good friend Eric Mickles. Is that a Tiger Electronics? It sure is. We were just talking about Tiger Electronics Talk Boy. Oh my gosh, I know. And this is uh, this is brutal because. You really, you got, Cyclops has to jump and shoot these guys who look like Apocalypse coming down, and it's, uh, it's real complicated. It's so funny to me, because that game came out yeah. when the X-Men were super hot, but you play yeah. as Cyclops, and sometimes you call him Wolverine. Well, that's true, and I have beaten the first level, uh, where you, you have to beat the Juggernaut, uh-huh. and then you get to the second level, you know, but in the entirety of the first level, I never found a Wolverine... You have to like pick up a Wolverine token, but there was never one, so I couldn't do it. Weird. Oh, oh! Papa just got his health. Papa just got his health up. I anyway, wonder if sorry, they chose Cyclops because those games it's easier to do ranged. Yeah, you have to shoot. I I don't see what else you could do. Yeah, I just wonder. Like, in, yeah, I had a Jurassic Park one that was brutal. Yeah. Um, Anyway, I'm having a good time with it. Yeah. I'm having a good time with this, bringing back a lot of memories. I remember I had a Batman Returns one mm. that I played quite a bit. Yeah. These these were where it's at. The coolest thing I've ever had in my life, in my life, was a watch that played Street Fighter. <laughs> like you, it was it was just Blanca mm-hmm. and Guile, mm-hmm. and you'd just sit there and you'd like play on the watch. Watch things were all the rage. In, in that time, like in the 90s. when uh, The Lost World came out, Burger King gave out one. You bet we went yeah. through Burger King to get me a Lost World. It was a like, plastic one that looked like a skeleton. You opened yeah. it up, and then you could yeah. do a glow-in-the-dark T-Rex skeleton. It, yeah. I had that for years. Yeah. That was my oh, I watch. know. So, yeah, that, that watch was pretty awesome. But, no, I, I want to thank you for my birthday present here. Yeah. I've been having a good time with it. Talk anyway, uh... Thanks for joining us on our comic book coffee break. I'm Nick Gunning. And I'm Eric Mickles, known online as Dusk versus Tweak. I am drinking Yubin coffee here with a little bit of uh, Irish cream syrup in it. It was piping hot, but I don't know. We've just been gabbing a couple of uh, chatty Cathy's, yeah. right? And so now it's a little on the cool side. It's it's a room temperature coffee mm-hmm. that I'm drinking today. But you know what? I'm fine with it. I don't, I don't, I don't mind. I'm drinking Coca-Cola, but I need to go cold cur- turkey on this thing because I've been drinking a lot of Coca-Cola lately. Do you really? And I Have you ever – you can acclimate to the sparkling water pretty well. That's what I did very successfully. I think it's the it's the spark – it's the fizz, but it's also the caffeine. Yeah. So I don't know. Yeah, I don't caffeine. know what to do. Just Caffeine will get you. Oh, age and then die, I guess, is what <laughs> I'm going to do. Yeah. Uh, we all are. All right. This show is brought to you by the Radio Meanwhile Network. You can find more about this show and others like it at the network's website, radiomeanwhile.com. But again, there is no show like this one. True. <laughs> this is this is the unique, uh, the, the crowning jewel on this network. No, it's not really. But it's good times. Find me a show with two white guys <laughs> talking about comic books no, on the I, internet. I, low, I wouldn't even know where to video. look. I wouldn't even know where to look. <laughs> I wouldn't even know where to look. Anyway, these are the references you missed in WandaVision this week. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Uh, do you want to just, I mean, do you want to just get into WandaVision or do you want to save that for a little bit no, later? we can talk WandaVision first if you want to. Okay, well, let me let me tell you first about my Scarlet Witch reading and then we'll, okay, then we'll yeah, let's talk to about Scarlet Witch first then. So last week, who was it? Who was it in the chat who was asking about um, I believe it was homework? Rob. For WandaVision. Rob, thank you, because I really wasn't thinking about uh, doing that. And yeah. then we got that question, and I was like, oh, holy crap, I should do that. Mm-hmm. So, read and loved the vision. I read all three volumes of Scarlet Witch. It's 15 15 issue series, mm-hmm. 2015, I want to say. Yep. Uh, by James Robinson, back to back to back. Mm-hmm. Um, and I also just, uh, in the last couple of days, I re-listened to your episode on Previously on X-Men of the, of the Scarlet Witch character spotlight. Mm-hmm. Because there's a lot of little references to Scarlet Witch history that I didn't really get, but um, in the show, you or know, in the comic, in the in the comic, okay, in the comic. Yeah, I mean, I I would say that I enjoyed this. I wish that the aesthetics of the cover stayed consistent throughout the books because I love every trade cover. Mm-hmm. Don't you? Do you like that look? Yeah, yeah, they're cool. They're stylistic. I think that's super cool. And the art starts really strong, and I feel like goes kind of downhill. Mm-hmm. And where the first volume, I found myself liking each volume progressively less Mm -hmm. because the first volume is pretty standalone. It's kind of a goofy premise where she's like, witchcraft is broken because I guess witchcraft can be broken. Yeah. And so she's trying to 
fix witchcraft. And so it becomes sort of a quantum leap, the Incredible Hulk, right. the fugitive kind of setup. And I was down with that. Mm -hmm. But each volume, like as the episodes progressed, they kept trying to like mash it back into continuity. And the more it connected, there was a Civil War II tie in. And it was Ooh, just like, yeah, rough. this is not the kind of this is not the kind of series that you want a one off Civil War II yeah. tie in with. So I feel like this would have been much more successful if it just was its was an island, you know, if it just was its own thing start to finish. Because the more they try to pull it into the main continuity, the less I was interested. How far did you get in this series? I think I only read the first volume. Yeah, well, that's I, the best. I think I read three, it so. for the Scarlet Witch spotlight we did. And that's our yeah. first character spotlight we did on that podcast. So mm -hmm. I feel like it's a little sloppy. And I in Scarlet Witch is definitely the character I've known the least about doing that, mm -hmm. doing that uh a spotlight for so but luckily your wife hillary is the scarlet witch fan so she was able to help guide me through i you know i did notice that in the uh not not that you were sloppy i didn't think you were sloppy but uh it was a lot more like usually in the character spotlights and previously on x-men you are the one who's pushing it and she's commenting mm -hmm. and this one it was more like reversed yeah. where she was taking us through yeah. the story and you were like oh yeah questions i had to be like so what happens here yeah yeah i don't understand <laughs> Yeah, mm -hmm. she's got a history. Um, yeah. Yeah, in the comics, I just, again, she's just one of those characters. There's characters I've been feeling lately in in Marvel, I think, more than DC, because DC's always rebooting it. So if somebody's evil yeah. in, in 1999, they're not evil in 2009. Um, right. But with, like, Marvel, because it's still pretty much a singular continuity, it's hard to, like read a character like scarlet witch with all the stuff that has gone on yeah. all the like you know same thing with quicksilver he's gone from villain to hero to villain that every time he becomes he's on the side of the angels it's just like yeah but every time yeah. magneto joins the x-men you just want them to be like maybe not this time we've given yeah. you three three strikes magneto I don't know. Well, I, I mean, you, you the make the family. point in that episode. Yeah, you make the point in that episode that she, at this point she's just damaged goods, and there's no way that you can re rehabilitate that character given the history it that she like has. It feels like Cyclops is the same way. Just yeah, these characters oh, that once you get once definitely. you make these certain decisions, it's just like you just stop feeling invested in them. But I guess. But that again, though, I feel like that that was the weakness of this James Robinson series, mm -hmm. The Scarlet Witch, I, because it feels very independent for a long time. And then, then when it starts to connect, like all of these things unravel because you're like, well, if that happens still, then mm -hmm. why are we following this character? Or like, it just, it, you know, it became a house of cards by the end. And I, I really wasn't into it. Um, the Scarlet Witch in a movie, I feel like it's just, I don't know. She's kind of somewhere in between this, like probability magic versus like just straight up witchcraft. How do you, how do you, what do you think her powers are in the in the MCU? Because I honestly, I never in can the quite movies, follow it. It feels like it's just telekinesis. Like it right, feels yeah. like it's just it's telekinesis, but then also telepathy because she's able to uh, possess or you know manipulate yeah, their minds does, and yeah. Ultron. But it really doesn't feel like magic or probability. But it's this even like no, it doesn't. Doctor Strange never necessarily feels like magic. It's always just kind of like energy based. I feel like superhero movies yeah. tend to be very afraid of what magic could mean. Whereas maybe we're seeing something different with Wanda Vision. I think so. I mean, I you know the comments you made about Twitter on Twitter about not really caring about their relationship. Um, I, I I get that. Like, what was your other point? You, you said you didn't like their relationship and you, and you didn't oh, it's just, care uh, about this version of Scarlet Witch? No, no, not not that I don't care about this. It's just I still, any time I see Scarlet Witch now and new stuff, I'm like, you said no more mutants and you're not Magneto's daughter and you're not oh, a yeah. mutant okay. anymore. So, so it's just all right, like... so you're still grumpy. The, the stuff that, like, got me invested in the character in the first place, you know, daughter of Magneto, she's a mutant, she's a mutant hero, now she's... Yeah not those things and she caused this problem and because of that problem it's hard to like see her in these hero lights that they keep trying to like rehabilitate her it's like okay well yeah it's it it's the same thing as like yes darth vader threw the emperor down that shaft yeah yeah and, right but he still killed everybody like that does not right. make him a good yeah. person anymore if anything it's no. a selfish decision so right but with with movie scarlet witch no i i like movie scarlet witch for the most part but like her envision in the movies their relationship it's been like five minutes it's barely off the ground yeah there there are a couple in uh in infinity war 
because mm-hmm. they're in Civil War, they're just kind of talking, so that we yeah. know they talk. In yeah. Infinity War, they are a couple, but then he gets, mm-hmm. you know, Thanos shows up, and then Spoiler alert. it's just her <laughs> in uh, yeah. Endgame. So, yeah. I I guess if you're really into that, like, two minutes where they're just walking around, I think it was Paris or London, I'm happy for you. But I don't think you, know, you I need don't think... that investment for this show. <laughs> I was just going to say, I don't think so either. I, I know what you're saying, because I was, after we watched the, the two episodes, I was trying to even remember, like, when was the last time we saw Vision? Like, what was the status of their relationship? Because I only have, like, vague memories of yeah. them being in the Avengers compound, like, flirting with each other. Yeah. But um, I just kind of approached this show, like, I really, really didn't know what they were doing with it. Like, I've never, I, I purposely avoided watching, like, a trailer. Mm-hmm. I've only seen, like, you know, promo images and stills and things. So I wasn't really, I didn't have a sense of what they were doing. Mm-hmm. But as soon as we opened, like, in black and white on the set of the Dick Van Dyke show, I mean, I was like, okay, well, yeah. they've just bought my interest for at least yeah. 30 minutes. But, um, <laughs> no, I mean, we watched the two back-to-back, and, I mean, we were both but you all in on you, it. I thought it was great. You weren't allowed to watch uh, Bewitched, right? No, I wasn't allowed to watch Bewitched, but I got it. No, I, mean, I, I know you got it, but I was thinking yeah. you have the Dick Van Dyke and I have Bewitched, but I, I don't think we have uh, the other way around. I, I've well, seen I love I, Lucy, not Dick Van yeah, Dyke. Yeah, yeah. I don't think that in, in the in the first episode, when they're, they're clearly the set in the, you know, the world, I think, is modeled on like a Dick Van Dyke style. Neither Vision nor the Scarlet Witch are acting like Dick Van Dyke or Mary Tyler Moore. Yeah. Like they're not they're not really doing like a, even a take on those characters. I think they're just sort of like you imagine them being like the next door neighbors. My or husband. I'm so impressed. Like I just want to know, like because both the actors, Paul Bettany and um as Elizabeth Olsen, mm-hmm. I mean, they both are just so locked in in mm-hmm. both versions to the to the characters and the tropes of classic TV. Mm-hmm. I mean, did they go to like some crash course in classic TV? Are they just classic yeah. TV fans? Yeah. Because a whole bunch I'm of like, I love Lucy uh, yes. impersonators were running them through boot camp. Honestly, I, I just feel like everyone involved in that process, uh-huh. I mean, had to have such a keen eye to make those works because both episodes were just completely locked mm. in to the er- era of TV they were sort of lampooning. Yeah. So, I it's mean, so funny. I was that, yeah, I was talking to Kendra because like. How many like, pe- how many like I say kids, but how many people born in like 2001 <laughs> and now are MCU fans who might not have like a single frame of reference for this? You know yeah. what I mean? Well, yeah, I do, I do. I don't think you necessarily need it no, though. No, I, mean, I know, I... but it's just it's just an interesting concept to do to people who it like. Is. I only watched a lot of these shows because of Nick on Nick at Night. Yeah. So like, I don't know. Just the idea that like. Some people will be watching this and like, oh, I guess this is based off a show that was on. I think, I think you know, people like you or I who can who can see the really like clear homages to specific mm-hmm. shows get a little something extra yeah. out of it. But I think if you didn't recognize that that was a set from the Dick Van Dyke show or didn't recognize the Bewitched tropes, even switching to color in Bewitched, I thought was a clever little nod because mm-hmm. that happens in the series. Oh. It starts black and white and switch to color. Kendra, Kendra I think even, dared even, to ask me. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> No, I'm just even if you don't get the specific right. references, I think the average person would at least understand that they're lampooning early yeah. television, and that's really all you need to know. Kendra, Kendra thought it'd be interesting to ask me if I like Bewitched or uh, I Dream a Genie more, and it was just like, are you oh. kidding me? I didn't meet Samantha from no. Bewitched. I met Genie. No. I met yeah. Barbara. Eden. I mean, you know, Elizabeth Montgomery's long dead, but but your point still <laughs> remains. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I. I liked it for the trope stuff. I'm not I'm not super into like the mystery of things. There's a name here that we haven't really heard since uh Age of Ultron. Yeah. In the show, uh you see it during one of the commercials, uh one of the watch brands. Yes, and yeah. And I'm just kind of like, well that is also a character who was there for what like 2 minutes. In yeah. Age of Ultron, and like he was kind of played a bit goofy. Like I thought he was more menacing in the uh, the like mid credit scene that came with uh, Winter Soldier, where he's talking about the twins and stuff. But like, yeah, yeah, and this I'm like, okay, so, but he does have kids in the comics. I don't know. Honestly, I was just all in. I wasn't really like I, I enjoyed the little the little blink and you miss it um, Easter eggs that were peppered throughout, but. 
I guess I just didn't really feel super beholden to like MCU canon or, or, you know, comparing and contrasting things. I just am sort of approaching it like it's just its own thing. And, and I'm interested to see where it goes, because like I said, I just feel like it's really they're really doing a good job of capturing those things. And every time you see a little bit of a break in Wanda where she kind of snaps out of it in the first episode where the boss is choking and it's going on for too long or, you know, when she gets a glimpse of something in the second episode and she kind of snaps into the real person and then kind of pulls back into the sitcom character. Mm -hmm. I thought all of those transitions were perfect. And Paul Bettany is so, I mean, he's perfect. He's so funny. Like every little thing he does just cracks Uh me up. Uh, so yeah, and I love Catherine Hahn too. I mean, yeah. put Catherine Hahn in anything, and you're going to get husband. you know a little extra. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I thought Kat Dennings was going to be in this show. I heard that too. I guess maybe not the first two episodes, yeah. but yeah, I, I, I had haven't seen that. her like in the credits or anything. Um, it's funny, Elizabeth Olsen. It's nice that we have her in life because yeah. now we know, like, oh, this is what the Olsen twins would have been like had they been normal. <laughs> you know, now I don't even. I try to like. Yeah. I can't even tell you which Olsen twin looks like what now. Uh huh. They're all just skeletons. Haunting they do. I mean, she, cemeteries. she does look very similar. Like it, she does. Oh, you yeah. definitely can tell that she's an you Olsen. Know, she, yeah. Yeah. Um, she's one of them. Yeah. She, she's, she's doing good. And it's nice because she gets, this is, you know, the most screen time she's had. So it's nice that yeah, like, yeah. a character like Scarlet Witch is getting this much, but it is, it is also kind of weird to put her in a weird world where I feel like, I guess we know about her a bit because she has had screen time, but she's not as like defined as a character as like, you know, the other long term no. Avengers. Um, no. So it's, it's kind of weird. Like we're getting to know her most now in a thing where everything's weird and she's not necessarily yeah. herself. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I was just so impressed with the acting involved yeah. because I mean, you, the characters that they're playing in the MCU, you know, from Jarvis right up to Vision and then, and, you know, Scarlet Witch. Yeah, talk, Paul Bettany, what a ride he's had. Like, I know, he, he, I know. He, he completely forgot he'd even voiced Jarvis in the first Iron Man movie until they asked just, him to come back. I just think that's so funny because it's like Paul Bettany signs up for some, like, a voiceover gig that probably took him, like, two hours yeah. in a booth one day. Yeah. And, like, here he is yeah. all these years later. But it's so impressive to me to cast actors for completely different purposes and then throw them into the nonsense of WandaVision and have those two actors just, like, meet the task head on yeah. and, like, elevate it, I think is so impressive because yeah. it's hard It's hard to make that switch, I think, you know, mm-hmm. to go, like, they're they're hired for their you know seriousness especially i would say elizabeth olsen scarlet witch is not a particularly funny or light character in the movies and to kind of turn that completely on its head and have her be like only fun and light is yeah. it's impressive it, it shows range in both of them that that i i was glad to see mm-hmm. um there was one more oh i i have no time though for like people speculating like uh, house of m or this is how we're oh. going to get, like, mutants and X-Men into the yeah. MCU. I'm like, if that happens, then I'm even less invested in this stuff than you think. <laughs> it's just, it's so funny. People want these storylines, but without any of the buildup. I don't understand it. People are like, all right, we're getting House of M. I'm like, you haven't had the X-Men, and you want House of M? What would be the point? She's not even a That's mutant true. anymore! I know. Ugh. I think, you know, I, I feel like part of the reason why I'm enjoying this as much as I am is because I have no wants from it. Yeah, that's true. I don't have any, I don't have any endgame for it. Yeah. I'm not like, I hope you it don't have any what? I hope it's Nick, where we go. Nick, uh, shut uh, up! He said endgame! Endgame. Wah, wah, wah! Confetti. But I do, Confetti. I do really feel like that's, that's helping me because I don't have expectations of it. I'm just enjoying the ride. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I think we're going to get nine episodes. So. Nine. Okay. I wondered. Uh, yeah. Yeah, looking forward and then to more. It, is Falcon and Winter Soldier the next thing we'll see Marvel wise? I think so. Yeah, I actually thought that was supposed to be first, and I don't know if it was like switched because of uh, coronavirus or not. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, or maybe I was just wrong. I'm I'm up. I'm less up to date with this stuff than I used to be. No, I up. I think you're right. I think pre COVID Winter Soldier, or sorry, whatever it is. Um, Falcon, and Winter Fal- Soldier. Falcon and Winter Soldier, yeah, was supposed to be the first of the shows. I remember that being a thing. Because but... this is supposed to lead into the Doctor Strange movie that she's supposed yeah. to be in as well. So, right, we'll see. Are you? I, I know you're in the process of catching up with uh, the CW shows. Oh did you ever watch Batwoman, or did you not? No, I haven't caught up to Batwoman yet. Because season two Batwoman starts tonight, Ooh. and so I'm pretty Batwoman. excited to meet this new character. But once again. 
it kind of blows my mind at the lack of cohesion that DC has because like there is still other than like a other than an, a six issue anthology thing that has nothing to do with the show mm-hmm. there is still not a comic book called Legends of Tomorrow <laughs> you know like it's just I mean, it's not that I seriously want that, but it's like they did Arrow, they did the Arrowverse, they did Supergirl, and they did Flash comics based on the series, mm-hmm. but nothing for Legends of Tomorrow. Right. And same thing with Batwoman here. Like, you're, it's a huge deal, I think, to be introducing a new like black female character who is headlining a you know a Batman World series mm-hmm. and not have any sort of lead up on that character. Like, why is there not a six issue? Or just like, you know, a a graphic novel or a prestige something that comes out that's sort of like an intro to this character. I would just think, I mean, it would sell like hotcakes and I feel like there's a lot of interest in it. And the fact that like right now this is the Batman world series that we have and it's led by a black woman. I just I don't know why they're not capitalizing on that. Yeah, I don't understand. I don't know. So anyway i plan on watching that you can watch it free on the cw app the next day Mm -hmm. so i'm planning on watching it monday tomorrow and uh maybe i'll report back next week Mm -hmm. uh speaking of batwoman yes i read uh two volumes of detective comics really i read one i read volume two of detective comics but between one and two is night of the monster men that's kind of a crossover Mm -hmm. between batman detective comics and nightwing uh, yeah. and it was just a gross mess. It was just, uh, <laughs> not, not gross just because the monsters are gross, which a lot of the monster designs okay. are very gross. And maybe that's like the strength of that series, but it's just like, I don't know who, who like mo- giant monsters. Yeah. And like grotesque monsters are taking over Gotham and the Batman team has to fight them. But like, what, what kind of Batman story is this? Yeah. It just, it just strikes me as like. You have Batman and his team of Batman and Nightwing dealing with these giant monsters. And I'm like, these are just people with some yep. tools. I don't know. It just, it's such a weird concept for Batman to be dealing with on like this level. Like Batman fighting like a monster that you'd see Godzilla duke it out with. Yeah. It's such a strange concept. It's such a strange concept to stretch over like nine issues or however long this crossover was. And not have the crossover be good. I didn't like it at all. I remember we talked about this on the All the Book Show uh, in episode 205 when we were interviewing Lauren James. But um, I, my feelings pretty much just echoed yours. Like, I just thought it was sloppy and gross. But I feel like, worst of all, it was just boring, you know? Yeah, like, yeah. the Monster Man was... It was just dull. It was not good. So, I mean, that's kind of unforgivable. I felt more fondly about Volume 2, yes. the, the Victim so Syndicate. I read vo- you liked I that, read right? Volume 2. That's with the Victim Syndicate. Which is yes. an interesting idea. They're all people who have been hurt or lost people because of Batman's war on crime. Right, um, right. And they're all kind of almost like reverse plays on uh, Batman villains. Like you have somebody yeah. who's inspired by Scarecrow, so they have anti-fear toxins. And you have somebody who was affected by Clayface. So you have, it's it's like these bizarro versions of Batman villains. Um, I don't necessarily, like... It's funny, you see a team like this, I'm like, I don't even, I don't know if this is really a problem for Batman, Yeah. let alone Batman and his team, but... I, I think the thing, in, we're talking volume two, yeah. right? Just volume yeah. two. I, the thing I liked about this the most, I think, was the dynamics between Batman and Batwoman. Mm-hmm. I just think this is a, the relationship that they, the way they explore it in this is kind of a unique um, dynamic for Batman. You just don't see that, that level of relationship very often, yeah. and so I really liked that. But I felt like after all the things that were set up in volume one, this just felt like, oh, OK, I guess we're going in a different direction. Like, I felt like it was a real disconnect between the two. Mm-hmm. And of course, I mean, Monster Man was just garbage. But <laughs> yeah. this whole this James Tinian's run here is always I think after the first volume, I never really put it above like a three star. You know, it's just mm-hmm. kind of like a whatever series to me. Well, I've got volumes three through seven on my nightstand. Uh, so... I've only read through volume five, oh, okay. so I can't maybe maybe after that it gets uh, you know. Well, again, I started here because he's the one that took over the Batman title after Tom King left. Yeah. Uh, yep. So I figured, like, if you've been writing this much Batman, you probably got something to say. So I wanted to yeah check it out. I like the the Batman the the team he's put together, and I know you were yeah, annoyed with Clayface. 
Um, well, but I like Clayface, and that's probably a lot of nostalgia from the old animated series. Even though he was like, you know, a straight villain in that, there was still some fun episodes. Uh, I like Clayface too. It's not, it, especially I think in the first volume, I think it was done well. But as the series progressed, I just find like the focus on Clayface and like his own personal struggles to me kind of started dominating the story a little more than I wanted to. Okay. And I was just like, yeah, we get it. You know, uh, Clayface. I understand. This is the most Batwoman I think I've read. I think that's true. I've read one of her series and it was like one of those weirdo, like Alice in Wonderland yeah, series. I, um, I'm the Batwoman disappointed with what... title. Oh yeah. It, I don't know. I, I, I agree with you. And I read Elegy. I think that was yeah. probably the first thing that I read. What I, what I've never read, which was the thing that kind of brought Batwoman to the forefront was, uh, 52 just that series called 52 that right. dealt with that's um, where she showed up went, the post yes in that oh, yes and that I went for like a 52. full year yeah. it was an no issue, uh, we... that went for a full year and it was all like kind of the b squad you yeah. know it was like not not the not the top tier people so um oh i mean i elegy was thinking? elegy was super weird weird yeah. i liked it okay um and rebirth has been kind of fine the first volume solid but i i too felt like uh, this first Detective Comics mm-hmm. issue here was kind of the best Batwoman I'm not on the page so far. I don't know what they were doing with spoiler at the end of Volume 2, where she's now standing between Batman and his job and stuff. Oh, Cause, yeah. Because of, yeah, yeah. of what's going on with Tim. It just feels like, yeah. I don't know if Stephanie Brown is that... I don't know. She seems yeah. very like emotionally fraught. Yeah, and I don't know, but again, I don't know where we're supposed to be with like spoiler and Tim Drake in terms of characters re- rebirth. So I'm just yeah. I'm trying to get in the mindset before they reboot everything again, and I have to relearn Tim yeah. Drake's history and everything. I mean, at this point, it's uh, 20 years since 2001. Aren't, aren't we getting close to 20 years of Infinite Crisis? So yeah, I guess so. Next. Yeah. Um, anyway, so yeah, that's what I was reading. What else have you okay. been reading? I finished a collection called Super Friends Saturday Morning Comics Volume One, and this is uh, it's the first twenty six issues of the Superman uh, Super Friends series with some uh, you know oddballs in there as mm-hmm. well. Here's the thing with this Super Friends, uh-huh, you know, sure. like my love of the Super Friends dates back to you know Super the late eighties, yeah. yeah. And one of the things that I really appreciated about this run is that someone took the time to smooth out super friends and explain some things that they never really cared to explain in the comic in the series like it didn't matter but in the early issues when a character first sees the hall of justice they're like oh this is the justice league's headquarters and one of the characters is like no 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 that's the watchtower satellite that's up in space this is just the compound that we use when we're training young superheroes so like right there an explanation of like the watchtower versus the hall of justice i thought was like oh okay well that's kind of interesting mm-hmm. in the show the first couple iterations have wendy and marvin who are don't have powers and i always hated them yeah, and then they just moves. they just vanish and then the Wonder Twins come in, like no explanation, which, you know, again, you don't really care when you're just watching it as a kid. But this had Wendy and Marvin sort of graduate from their super friends training. Uh-huh. And then they're like, before we want to be superheroes, we're going to go off to like college. And overlapping with that, the Wonder Twins have like landed on Earth and are kind of lost. And so they take them in. So they're like, well, if Wendy and Marvin are leaving, can we sort of be your new protégés? And they're like, OK, sure. And so, like, the transition is actually explained. And then a little bit later, mm-hmm. Wendy and Marvin come back. There's you know, like, war. 20... No, like, 20 issues later, they come back, and it's like a surprise, like, who was helping us? And it turns out to be Wendy and Marvin. And I was just like, look at that! You know, like, adding <laughs> adding some continuity to the Super Friends. Uh-huh. I liked it. They also did some things, like... You don't actually see um, Batgirl, but they go somewhere and someone... You think it's Batgirl, but it's someone disguised as Batgirl, which was cool, mm-hmm. because you never see um, you never see Batgirl in the in the Super Friends, so that was fun. And then later on, uh, Wonder Woman teams up with Nubia, who is you know her sister, mm-hmm. and is now you know Aletha Martinez just did that remodel of Nubia, mm-hmm. and she's like you know a big part of continuity again. And there she was like back in the Super Friends comic. Right. So I don't know, you know, I mean. I don't think it would work for somebody who doesn't have a fondness for sure. either Silver Age style storytelling or the Super Friends. Right. But for me, I mean, it was really it was nice to have a little lightness during this time. Mm-hmm. So I've got no complaints. Um, 
super friends. I guess then I read Hellblazer. Huh. <laughs> so that's not light. Yeah. No, it's not. Um, though I don't think I've read so much at night again to avoid the you. weird yeah, dreams the yep. book has been given me. You do have to be careful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Sean Phillips is the artist uh, who's been working with. So the, I'm on Paul Jenkins run right now. Okay. And Sean Phillips is the uh, artist. And I'm trying to think, Oh, he did kill or be killed with, okay. um, with Ed Brubaker, which I really liked. And he did some, some of his art is in the Bruce Wayne fugitive. Um, so I thought he had, I love that. I love that whole story. Bruce Wayne, murderer, Bruce Wayne, fugitive. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I guess he's worked a lot with Ed Brubaker these more recently. I thought he had done something. Uh, Oh, Marvel zombies. All right. I'm going to stop looking through his stuff, but I did like um, <laughs> killer be killed anyway. Okay. Um, Paul Jenkins run. It's interesting because I don't know what the identity of this run is. He's been playing a lot with, uh, in Garth Ennis's run, uh, Hellblazer or Constantine and, uh, some, some people he, he got to help him took care of Satan, not Lucifer. They took care of Satan, uh, ended up stabbing him in the back and he was disappearing and Satan had this, and he had this question like, where will I go? Because he was about to die. And right. Paul Jenkins was like, I'll answer it. He ends up in a, he's, he's at a fishing dock. He's, he's helping some people in England and he's at a dock and he's, he's not having okay. a good time. And so then sure. he gets his powers back and now he's back in hell. And it's just kind of like, yeah, who, I don't know. It, it was a weird decision to go directly into a story that Garth Ennis had finished before yeah, he left. Yeah, that is odd. And that I guess odd. I just feel like. The big thing is that Hellblazer split up his, like, used magic to create, like, a doppelganger that has, like, his bad qualities that he sent to hell to make up a, to finish mm-hmm. up a deal. And now he's, like, going around experiencing things so that he can feel complete. So he's trying to, but it's just, it's a little unfocused and not entirely coherent on why or what he's doing to be this complete person. Like, he has to be a jerk to someone so that he can feel, I don't know, uh, it's strange. Anyway, that means I've read 107 issues of Hellblazer now. Crazy. Um, I've not read any, like, standalone Constantine. I've read, Justice like, League you Dark. know, Justice League. No, well, yeah, I read the first volume. Mm-hmm. I read some, like, random things where he shows up. Like, one of the more recent um, magic Justice League iterations mm-hmm. with Wonder Woman at the lead. Yeah, uh, okay. But I've never actually <laughs> sat down and just read it. Uh, oh, I guess. Well, I've read the old, like the older. Yeah, the new one's called like Justice Wonder League Woman and Justice League Dark or Justice something League like Dark that. Yeah. Um, Books of Magic was a really good uh, showcase for him. Uh, Neil Gaiman's Books of Magic. It was a good showcase for all of DC's Magic Universe. Uh, yeah. I kind of wish there was a little bit more. Hellblazer keeps the regular DC Universe at more than an arm's length. So the idea that yeah. like the Phantom Stranger and Swamp Thing and Mystery and Zantana yeah. and Etrigan are all out there. It's yeah. we know that's true, but like they don't really reference it much because he doesn't have a lot of time for it. And I kind of wish there yeah. was a bit more of that. Um, anyway, my look. Well, I think the thing is what what you and I both equally want is a Dark Knight Returns style story for Detective Chimp. You know. Uh huh. I think that's I think that's what <laughs> I think that's what fans are demanding. Uh, you know. My local library has the next four volumes of Hellblazer, which I put on hold. Wow. Okay. Uh, they have them physically, and then after that, I'm on Hoopla, because okay. uh, they don't have it anymore. But I went on Hoopla to see what it, what volumes of Hellblazer they have, and they have volumes 15 to the newest one because they're still putting them out because they haven't oh. uh, they haven't collected all 300 issues yet. But then I decided to see if they had uh, Lucifer, the old like 90s series by Mike uh-huh. Carey, and they do. They have it oh all my on Hoopla. And I have not been able to find this in like physical trade anywhere. Like no library wow. ever has it. And maybe it's because it's a book called Lucifer. I don't know. Probably. But yeah. I'm stoked because wow. this it's, it's a spinoff of Sandman. Because in uh, in Sandman, uh, Lucifer decides to quit hell. He's going to go off. And th- yeah. th- 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 that's the series that that show is based off of uh, yeah. that's on Fox. Boy, I, I haven't seen that show, but the little bit of a crossover we got with that character and that actor in Crisis on an Infinite Earths for CW made me wish that I could watch a show about the devil, but I 
I just can't bring myself to do it. Yeah. But he was so good and so funny. Like, I just, it cracked me up. I think so, the show itself has gotten better some, uh, from mm. reviews I've seen that, like, it, it seemed just kind of like a note. Like, he's very whiny at the beginning, and it's kind of just a regular procedural, but I think it kind of picked up. Mm. So, yeah, I, I'm looking forward to, like, getting to that crossover, but also finally yeah. reading that Mike Carey series. But anyway, I got four more volumes of Hellblazer, and then I'm on Hoopla. Wow. So better hurry because Hoopla doesn't have things locked in forever. I know. That's the thing. So, but the problem is, the after, after Paul Jenkins, it's uh, the guy. Leroy I, Jenkins. No, it's the guy I really don't like. Brian Azzarello. Oh, yeah. So we'll no, see you don't like that. him. Not, I don't like yeah. him Batman for sure. But anyway, so I, know. I just kept reading Hellblazer. Okay. Uh, the think? last on my, my read list this week was March Volume 2 by John Lewis and Nate Powell. Autobiographical graphic novel about... Uh, you know, the civil rights movement in the sixties. This was, volume this one. was, yeah, I'd read volume one a while back too. And I always intended to read the others and I just hadn't, but you know, with Martin Luther King day coming up and everything, I, I picked it up John and read Lewis through recently it. passed away. He did. Yep. Recently passed away. Uh, it's, I mean, it's incredibly powerful, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, it's just, <laughs> it's just one of those things where like on the one hand, all you have to do is like turn the news on and it's obvious that this is the thing that has happened. It could happen and hopefully won't happen again. But it also almost feels fantastical that something that extreme mm -hmm. was so commonplace. So it is a, it's a powerful read. And I, I had um, volume three was checked out from the mm -hmm. library, so I had yeah. to put a hold on it. But I, I plan to finish off the series here. But if you haven't read this series, I mean, I think it's, I think it's really, just it's a really good piece of history, and it's a, it's presented well in graphic novel format. I don't remember. But, was this black and white, or is it like muted it is, colors? Um, no, it's kind of like shades of, of like blues and grays okay you know but yeah it is it's limited color definitely uh yeah did you say that's the last thing you read because you had me also lock in a, a mr miracle <laughs> you're right yes i did i forgot about that yeah um and do you want to do one of yours no go ahead i have another okay. one okay okay I finished off the Jack Kirby run, at least, of Mr. Miracle. Mm -hmm. And I read I read this little out of order because we interviewed Steve Englehart for the All the Book Show. And I read his run of um, Mr. Miracle, which picks up post-Jack Kirby. Like, the Kirby issues go until 70s. Oh, okay. Well, by the time by the time Englehart takes over... No, I think it was. I think it was like 78, something like that. But... Mr. Miracle under Jack Kirby runs for 18 issues. It's collected a few different ways. I read it in two volumes. Um, and then like three or four years later, they pick up the numbering and Steve Englehart and Steve Gerber write, I don't know, you know, six or seven more, not too many. So I had read that a long time ago in preparation for the Englehart interview, which mm -hmm. you can find at soundcloud.com slash all the books. And so going back and reading Kirby's Mr. Miracle I feel like of all of the Kirby stuff I read, I understand Mr. Miracle the least. Hmm. Like I, I just, you could, you could write like a couple sentence synopsis of something like, um, even like the Eternals, which is kooky, but like the Eternals and new gods, that kind of stuff. You can sort of be like, this is what it's about. Uh -huh. But Mr. Miracle is like, he's an escape artist, but also fights apocalypse and also like has this relationship with Big Barda and they like travel. It's just, it's really, I don't know what it's about. Hmm. That's what it comes he down was to. In, I read 18 issues. I don't understand it. He had a spotlight episode in Justice League Unlimited. That was pretty fun. They got, uh, okay. Ian got, Oh, what's his name? The guy who played Mr. Fantastic in the first Fantastic Four. Oh, sure. Ian uh -huh. Goffman. Uh, mm, I don't think that's right, no, but I know who you mean. Ian Goff. Gruffled. It's like Yon Gruffled. Oh, thank you. Anyway, he, he played him and he was fun. Um, yeah. I was think there's a 1989 series that like J.M. De Mateus wrote the first eight issues for, and then mm, yeah. Len Wein and uh, well, Doug Mensch. If J.M. De Mateus wrote it, it's going to be kookier it's than Jack Kirby. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah. Um, so I've only read Mister Miracle, the Tom King series. Yeah. Um, which is also weird, but uh, different. Yeah, I guess I just assume he's just an ex escape artist who can get out of everything, and so he's like the only person to escape the apocalypse i guess and this this volume kind of won me back a little bit uh it kind of saved itself uh it get, got it got a star back mm. by the way it ends because it does actually He's resolve pretty stingy with those stars people he yeah. doesn't give them back just to anyone <laughs> it does kind of resolve but it's just you know jack kirby is not the style of writer who feels he needs to ground the story yeah 
I mean, it's like it's so heavily written, but there's never really a time where he's sort of like either in the dialogue or in like a summary where he's like, well, you know, this is kind of what's happening and that's what this character is and we continue on. It's just every issue you're thrown right into the middle of it, mm-hmm. you know? So, eh. All right. I didn't, re- I didn't really like this. I, I still say Devil Dinosaur is my favorite Kirby. <laughs> Definitely worth reading, Devil Dinosaur, but... My favorite you know, I read Kirby, all the classic Miracle now. My favorite Kirby is when he's wearing the Link hat. Oh, yeah. That's a good one. <laughs> uh, I, to this day, don't know what the Kirby games are about. I don't know what, what? they are. He's just he's just a little protector of, uh, of Dreamland. So what is it? Is, is it like a Mario-style game, but no, you're just a big pink no, it's, balloon? No, it's easier than Mario. It's not really a platformer in the sense that you're thinking. Kirby just walks around, he eats enemies, he steals their abilities, and then sometimes there's boss fights. Speaking of platformers, uh, I beat the Aladdin game on Switch, uh-huh. which you got me as we talked yeah. about. And after we discussed this, I did go back, and in fact, you're right, there are multiple versions of each game on it. Ah, okay. And there's a there's a final cut version of Aladdin, which is remarkably smoother. Like the Ooh. gameplay just makes a lot more sense. Okay. You know? Isn't the old game it would be like well, normally I can make this jump, but for whatever reason I can't at this moment. Mm-hmm. Or like I've hit this guy with a sword fifty times mm-hmm. and it doesn't seem to matter. It's very much like streamlined. I didn't think there'd be a noticeable difference, but there really was. So I w- I've been going back through and playing the Final Cut version. Lion King, impossible. I know it's, it's impossible. It's a, it's it's an impossible game. Yeah. It really is. But why I was bringing up platformers is that I finally got my hands on Scott Pilgrim. Yeah, it's back in the Switch store, uh, yeah, and I've been playing it. But it's hard. Uh, it's on Epic for PC and the other consoles, including Switch. This was gone. Like it was out. I know it was out for yeah. five years, and then they pulled it. And people who owned it couldn't get it. And it's like every, I remember seeing one tweet where somebody was like, "You shouldn't pirate games." And another person was like, "Biatch, I paid fifteen dollars for Scott Pilgrim five years ago, and I can't play it." And yeah, yeah, it's back, and now people are are happy. Yeah, I'm excited about it. Yeah. Listen, I'm going to need you to get your own Switch and a Nintendo subscription. Uh-huh. And then I need you, one, to help me beat Jay and Silent Bob's Mall Brawl. Oh, That's one. Uh-huh. I need your help. It's too it, hard. Scott Pilgrim? And Scott Pilgrim. Yeah. Those two things. Okay. I need I've you never play played with. this at all. This this had come out, I think, before I was back in I the never game. played it. Oh, you hadn't yeah. played it even when the movie and no. the books were out. Okay. No, I never did. Uh, I know no. people like the music and stuff in it, too, so... Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's still it's strange for me to see the comic book style Scott Pilgrim characters in color. Yeah, yeah. When I, when I do that, but I know. Yeah, that would be fun. I never went back and reread, you know, because they released them in color eventually, and I always thought, oh, I haven't read those in a while. I should do that. No, I never did. I didn't uh, either. But yeah, the Scott also, Pilgrim series. I Kendra yeah. was asking me about those. She's like, oh, why don't you just buy them and then I can read them? I'm like, I think Scott Pilgrim, the comic, was a very like right time, right place for me. And I don't necessarily know if, like, 12 years later, if it will land the same way. I know what you're saying, but I think it will. Oh, wow. I do. (laughs) Yeah, I think it will. Because it's not like it speaks to the, you know, it's not that it speaks to, like, 2008. Mm -hmm. It speaks to, like, 1994. And that's just always going to be fun. So, you know, it's not like that Side Scrollers that we read that was all about Darth Maul and Green Oh ketchup. my word, Side Scrollers is so ridiculous. But you know what? I, know. I had a good time with Side Scrollers too. I had a good time too. Yeah, I really did. <laughs> Pass me some. Really what was did. the ketchup? It was uh, green. the green, green ketchup, ketchup and the, the yeah. really drinking clear Pepsi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the whole thing. It was crazy. It was, it was a time it capsule. It was as 1999 as you could get, yeah. I have gotten back into uh, Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order uh, as well. Uh, yeah. I got away from that for a long time because it is an irritating game. I stand by that. Mm. It's a, it's a it's a curio from a bygone era, and there's a lot of problems that I feel like we've moved past mm-hmm. in this type of game. But I'm still I'm enjoying it more than I had before. Speaking so. comic book Star Wars, they just put okay. out the first issue of uh, the High Republic. The yes, new series. you know what? But it's just a single issue. It's not the trade. They put out the book two like i think kids books and then this first issue of this series yeah and that's the launch of the high republic and i feel like i was trying to get a sense of what to order because i know again when we interviewed justina ireland for the all the book show Mm -hmm. um we were talking about her lando book and deathless divide and stuff like that but she was talking about writing this book for the high republic 
uh, and that her book just came out as well. Mm -hmm. Then I was trying to sort of get a sense of like if if those matter at all, like what order you want to read them in, because they came out on the same day and everything, so they must not really have yeah, much. Yeah, I don't know. I got the novel. I'm reading it. I, I'm not super into it yet. Uh, uh, well, I, Charles Soule wrote that, right? Yeah. I don't know if it's his writing. You know what? It's. I've read a lot of his. He wrote the whole Poe Dameron series, and it kind of just like was spinning its wheels the whole time. So I don't know. The problem with like a Jedi focused thing especially during yeah. like a very high Republic, a very uh, well, well done Republic and all this stuff is that w when you get down to it, Jedi are just like sexless monks. And that doesn't really like, <laughs> you could just say monk. No, no. Yeah. The, the sexless is actually like super important to it because like, no, no, but, but like all monks are sexless. Yes, I'm I sorry. guess that's my point. Uh, yep. But like, you know, in the original trilogy, there's, the romance between Han and Leia, but yeah. you know, it's still, they, Luke, they were sex full monks. That's Luke, different. Luke doesn't have a relationship, but the whole idea that like no Jedi can have a relationship is just such a ridiculous thing to come out of Lucas from the prequels. And I get it because he needed to have something to keep Padme and Anakin separated. Padme, no. But going forward, it just means any like Jedi story is like, ah, here's some Jedi who can't have relationships. I can't yeah, wait to perfect. get into It's just, it gets it's very like the Fantastic dull. Four. <laughs> and so I it's one of the things I'm looking forward to with Star Wars stuff post Rise of Skywalker because oh, yeah. it seems like a lot of those like old traditions are not there anymore. And they're like, yeah, yeah you could be a Jedi and you can marry. Of course you can. What? We want another Darth Vader? Why not? No. So hey, anyway, you know that's what? an issue with High Republic at this moment that I'm reading a bunch of Jedi who are just kind of like, we will help. I'm like, all right, you're all good. And none of you like to kiss anybody. Why am I reading this? Oh, that's disappointing. I was I was looking forward to I'm that. I'm only 60 pages I, in. I read a, a YA Star Wars novel set in the new world, you know, mm -hmm. in, in the in the uh, Rise of Skywalker era. Oh. And it's a, it's a Poe Dameron book called Free Fall by Alex Segura. And it deals with the the relationship between him and the, the smuggler that you meet in Rise of Skywalker. Mm -hmm. And it's actually the first anything that I've read in the new, like, Disney like Force Awakens Beyond era that really felt like it was adding things to a character. We read this for a book club and we all kind of enjoyed it right. and felt the same way. So it was kind of nice to see that. But um, I read. I do want to read these High Republics. Yeah, the I'm I gotta finish the book so I can speak more honestly about it. And I'm more excited yeah. for the comics. Monthly comic book stuff, like the whole monthly publishing thing, is so it's archaic. Yeah. And I get it for some things. Because it's the same thing of like putting an episode out a week on a streaming platform instead of all at once. You keep it in the conversation. But I guess a monthly release schedule is just too long for it that is. kind of stuff. Like with the X Men, well, I mean, with the. What do you read? A, you read a comic book, it takes you what, like three minutes? Yeah. And then you have to wait 30 days yeah. for the next three minutes? And so I mean, the idea that you're putting out this big Star Wars launch and yeah. your comic book offering is one issue, and like why wouldn't you just want a trade paperback of six yeah. issues to put out with it? Cause that's the thing. Yeah. I mean, I guess you're just trying to double the money you can get, but like the whole reason the X-Men during house of X powers of X were so in the conversation was because it was weekly. And then the, yeah. there's been enough series that it's still a weekly thing that you're talking about these stuff. Whereas I'm shocked that there's anybody in the world who's buying single issue comics in any format. Well, at this point. I mean, people were for, I mean, people are, but a lot of them are also still buying them digitally where you can get them quicker. But yeah, it's just, it just doesn't seem like a smart, like marketing thing for something where you're launching this new line yeah. to just be like, here's the book in this 22 page comic that I know. will be, I agree. Well, well, that's why 30 days. I've kind of liked the uh, the TV model because like WandaVision dropped two episodes. Yeah. HBO Max had been doing that with like Flight Attendant and stuff. I mean, I don't that's wanna... at least gives you more of a bite, you know. I don't want to overwork artists and stuff, but there's also like the idea that like okay, we'll just do the six issues first and then put them out like exactly week after week yeah. after week instead of like yeah, it's I don't know, it's it's something that I feel like in the digital era you don't need this monthly schedule so much for certain things anymore, but. I know. I, don't know. I'm not I also things. wish, I mean, again, I don't buy a lot of single issue comics, but I've always yeah. kind of wished that you could buy like a trade paperbacks worth, you yeah. know, and then, then you just like get them as they come out, you know, it's just kind of, I don't know. Anyway, I'm still trying to know. talk about Sentinel. <laughs> Do it. <laughs> I yeah, read get Sentinel. In there. This was originally put out in like digest. Speaking of that, right? 
I know that I've read this. So, like, I, I recognize that artwork. There, I know I've read it. There are three digests. The artwork mm-hmm. is striking for the first two. So the it was a 12-issue series that came out in 2002, 2003. It was part is this of, on the app? Uh, yeah, this is on the app. Um, and then they did five issues later, like three years later. So there were okay. five issues in 2005. This was part of the... I don't know if you remember it, not just like the digest, but it was part of like the tsunami line. That's what they called it, the tsunami print. No. It was trying to chase after younger readers and some older readers that were yeah. into manga at the time. So that's where Sentinels came from. That's where Runaways got its start. Spider-Man Loves Mary Jane. Yeah, um, yeah. But also stuff like Mystique and Wolverine Schnicked were like adult mm-hmm focused ones so yeah this is a whole line that like was coming out when i was getting into comics but i wasn't into because mm-hmm. i think in 2003 i would have been 17 so i wasn't really yeah. looking for books for a younger audience well i mean i've said it before but i loved these because like you know i was like i you know i, mean, I didn't have a ton of money when these were coming mm-hmm. out and yeah, like you could get size yeah, but you like you could get a trade paperback of six issues for, you know, at the time, fifteen, twenty dollars. Yeah. Or you could get one of these digests with six issues for six ninety nine. Yeah. You know, so it was like cha ching, I'll I, take it. I think in general the line died because of low sales. Like it's just one of those things where like you get it, but they just couldn't really get it to yeah. honestly, your personal collection of these is the most I've ever seen them in one place. Well, I know my wife had like all the Runaways, and you I had, had yeah, I, I have Mary a lot of Mary Jane's there. and uh, Mary Jane, yeah, something else in there. Uh, oh, that Venom series that I had read too was in there. So, I don't know, it's strange. Anyway, the the art in this is done by uh, I'm not gonna say it right. Um, Udon, U D O N, all caps. Udon. They're they're the ones that did the Street Fighter comics as well. Oh, that okay. That are just so cool. Um, so they have like this very colorful, very like attractive art. I'm holding up my Street Fighter hardcover here. Um, not for me. No, not there. You go. So thank you. It, it's <laughs> you know it has a lot of energy into it. Um, now I gotta put this right back. St. Oh wait, no, that would go before Superman. Any the art's very good in the uh, these first twelve, and then they switch the artists in the last five. It's not so great. Anyway, the series is fine. It, a lot of people call it out for copying the Iron Giant, which I guess it does, but the Iron Giant isn't mm-hmm. a mutant killing machine. So there's like yeah. this extra element of menace about this kid having a sentinel that's repairing itself throughout the series, and you know eventually it's going to start going after mutants. Yeah. Um, there's moments where you have to wonder, like, oh, does the sentinel feel? Um, probably not. It's a sentinel. It's kind of like a boy and his robot. It's it's just a boy and his robot story for the most part. Yeah. In issue five, you think it's going to go in the direction where it's going to become like a kid bringing a gun to a school kind of analogy. Mm. And it does and it doesn't. And that's where I had to like remember that this I do is and I for... don't when I do when I don't. This is for kids. Yeah. So like he, he ends up having the Sentinel come to school and attacking, but not hurting anyone. He comes to like... And then he stops the Sentinel, so everybody thinks he's a hero. And that's issue six. And mm. I thought it, issue five is very emotional because things are just going terrible for him. And mm-hmm. he goes to his Sentinel, and he has a picture of the bullies that have been tormenting him. He's like, this is your primary target. And I remember like picking yeah. up an issue and seeing that and not seeing the resolution and always thinking, like, wow, that series went to a dark place. And it doesn't mm. really. It stays. Oh, okay. <laughs> just it stays just kind of goofy because the bully's like, "Oh no, my car!" And he's like, "I'll save." <laughs> and so, it if it had been geared to an older audience, I think it would have been a very dark turn, and uh, it would be hard to redeem the character after that. Um, but I felt like that's what they were trying to comment on. Anyway, um, by the end, it's just him traveling around with this sentinel. It's fine. This is a a book about a sentinel and a boy uh didn't really okay uh didn't do too much for me i liked it i could see why it would uh, appeal to a younger Sounds audience cute. but it's also very wordy so i don't know mm. it's wordy for this type some of, of those digests were though yeah. a lot of those were i don't get it so i don't know yeah i don't know either all right what's your uh quarter bin oh sure um i had my son go to i had my son go to the box and i was like just pick one that looks cool to you so he picks action comics 511 uh september 1980 
Now, I'm going to be focusing on the backup story because uh, this is the second time I've picked an issue that had a backup story featuring Airwave. Do you remember this? So you're going to focus on the Airwave backup story, not this thing that has Lex Luthor and Superman fighting back to back. I might. I might. But this... (laughs) The, I don't the think Superman your son story, picked. I think this yeah. is a betrayal of your son's choice because I don't he think he picked it up show. for for Airwave. He doesn't watch the show. I maybe I'll go back to it. The Superman Lex story is super long, but Airwave, okay. as you remember, yeah. we read it's like a golden age hero, <laughs> and then like that he dies and his wife becomes Airwave for a while, and then their son becomes Airwave. His name is also Hal Jordan, and he's like Green Lantern, Hal Jordan's cousin. It's a whole thing. But this is the second of these airwave uh, backups that I've read. And I was like, you know what? I'm into this character. <laughs> and so I was going to put together a, like a playlist in DC Universe of all the airwave appearances. And it's like they're conspiring against me because he does a big run in Green Lantern and he does a big run in Action Comics. And both of those are chunks where DC Universe doesn't have the issues. So... Sorry, man. I could read, like, classic Golden Age Airwave, but I don't think so. Let's get into it, though. Okay. All right. Yeah, let's this do This is Airwave. called Airwave. This has been long. A new, let's just, let's a just do new, the backup. I'm doing it. So wait, a new costume for Airwave. Yeah. So, air like, taking the cowl of Airwave is basically, like, a curse, it feels like. To, to become Airwave is to die. Maybe. I mean, the wife doesn't die. She just gives it up. Oh, okay. I thought she yeah. also died. The son's like, no, well, maybe she... for me. She does it to avenge her husband. Okay. And honestly, I, I would have liked to seen a series with her in the lead. But, you know, we get this like, I, why are they naming him Hal Jordan? I don't understand this at all. But anyway, this backup is by Bob Rizekis, uh, art by Alex Saviak. We have young Hal Jordan. Again, not the not one. Not Hal Jordan. New no. Other, yeah. He's biking in 100 degree, degree heat. Yeah. He has some regrets about uh, going for a bike ride in 100 degree heat. He's wondering how his cousin, Green Lantern, deals with wearing that tight costume under his street clothes in heat like this. Mm-hmm. Just then, our Hal notices some guys messing around on the top of the high school. They realize Use your that Green Lantern been ring, Hal Jordan. No, different, 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 different. They realize they've been spotted, but they dismiss the kid and they're like, ah. If he calls the police, we'll hear it on the radio that we brought. A radio. Wait, a radio, Eric. Suddenly, Airwave comes out of their he radio can use and is like, "Airwaves." Yes, he comes out of the radio. Yep. Uh, we hear that they, he figures out that they're rigging the sign to blow up um, when the school bell rings for the first time. Okay, uh-huh. so. Airwave, as he's tussling with these guys, we have little things where he's remembering advice from Green Lantern. He's remembering advice from Black Canary. Mm -hmm. He settles on the advice from Green Arrow, which is to punch first, ask questions later. So he punches these guys out, and in the fight, they blow the sign. So he's like, oh, I shouldn't have done this. I could have prevented the explosion. But he's treated like a hero in the newspaper, and he's really, he's struggling with that. Uh, Back at home, and now he lives with... um, his cousins. He lives with his cousins. I don't know why, but he does. So back Sometimes at the home, his just cousin nice to live with your cousins. His like cousin, who's an adult, who's like his caretaker, Jan, um, notices that he seems off, and she's worried that he's sick or something like that. Um, we know that he is struggling with being airwave, and he's just a little depressed. Mm-hmm. Um, so they head off to the doctor while Karen, the next door neighbor and love interest to Hal Jordan, not that one, but Airwave, oh, sure. um, yeah, is babysitting the younger kids. Well, the younger kids are playing hide and seek and they go into Hal's room and they get out the Airwave costume and rip it. Oh, so no. Karen's like, aha, I knew Hal was Airwave. But then the costume's ripped, right? So Hal comes back from the from the doctors and they say that he has sun poisoning. I think it's because of his powers, so they don't explicitly say. Mm-hmm. So bad news, Karen. We can't go to Six Flags after all. Oh, no. You know, it would be weird with it. if Hal what? Jordan went to Six Flags and saw oh. somebody dressed as the Green Lantern. Rode the Green Lantern right? even. Yeah. That'd be weird. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so Karen is fine with this because this gives her an opportunity to fix the suit. And not only is she going to fix the suit, she's going to make some improvements like pockets. Mm. So eventually, when he's feeling better, they do go to Six Flags. Is this like an all CGI suit, like in the movie? Nope, different, because you're thinking of Green Lantern, and this is Airwave, oh, cousin okay. of Green Lantern. Sorry. Different guy. Okay. So they go they go to Six Flags, uh-huh. and there is, and this is where things get a little dark, and you can tell that it's a different time, where this was just absurd and not the kind of thing that we worry about constantly. But there is a sniper in the Ferris Frick. wheel. Oh, 
trying to like pick people off because you know in the 70s that's absurd or 1980 this was that's absurd um so he quickly you know makes an excuse turns into the airway but is noticing all of these improvements on his costume right uh-huh. he takes the guy down he pulls some airwave handcuffs out of a new pocket on the suit cool. he's very impressed with it uh-huh. captures the villain and he's like oh crap i have to explain to karen where i was so he runs off and buys a big cowboy hat and was like hey karen i just had to buy this cowboy hat <laughs> and she's like mm-hmm, because now she knows what's up right. but he doesn't understand what happened to his costume but he's going to have to wait until the next issue of Action Comics to figure that out. Which you don't have access to. I don't think I do, no. I mean, this, the one that I pulled today is not on the app, so. So now Nick's great journey is hoping that the DC Lego games put Airwave out <laughs> into Lego form. Just like they did Jack of Hearts yeah. in, the, in the Marvel yeah. game, yep. Yeah. Jack of Hearts, which still not yeah. on the Marvel app, but Jack of Hearts was name dropped goofy, you previously on Goofy so. backup characters who have like one issue to their name are catnip to Nick. Okay. Airwave has about 50 appearances just with this version alone. Original. <laughs> yes. I know that because I looked it up today. Golden Age Airwave has uh-huh. over a hundred. Uh-huh. You can just shut yeah. up. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. Smokescreen was only in two issues and he has the ability <laughs> to make a smoke screen. Hey, I need to know if that's true or not, because I want to look that up. He's got a blue costume with a cape, but he's wearing a snorkel. (laughs) I must have this action figure. Well, he does sound fun. He does sound fun. (laughs) Eric, give me a, give me off the top of your head. I want a, a Batman recommendation. What do you got? Ah, 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 pressure. I'm attached. I'm attached. Hey, I want to hear it. You know what? The Batman daredevil crossover. Really? I'll recommend right now. Uh, I don't have a cover for it. Because wow. I wasn't planning to do it. The Batman Daredevil crossover yeah. would be my r- rando Batman pick. Because it, as a Daredevil story, I what okay. I really enjoyed about it is that it made me realize what a cool villain Two-Face is for Daredevil. Hmm. Because he's an XDA. Okay. Oh, and I Daredevil see. Yeah. is the yes is, is a lawyer, and so like Ugh. that was the thing. Point. They um, it was Batman and Daredevil teaming up to stop Two Face, and I was yeah. just reading it. I was like, man, I love Two Face as a Batman villain, but at the same yeah. time, I would love to see. Uh, here, let me let me download this cover quick. I'd love to see like just Two Face being like a constant villain for uh for daredevil it just seems like i don't know like a weird match made in heaven that you can never have so it's funny because i read this it was underwhelmed by it i was not yeah, impressed. no the story is not super great but it just kind <laughs> of like dawned on me i think blockbuster yeah. is i can't remember who the daredevil villain is but i was just reading it just being like man two-face daredevil of course yeah, yeah. A lot of stuff he happening He doesn't have there, powers, sure. so he's on that level. He's mm-hmm. XDA. He's got chance and everything. Daredevil's the You're man right. without fear. He makes his own luck. All that stuff. You are right. Yeah. So. Yep. Anyway, that would yep. be the rando pick uh, I would suggest. Um, gosh, I could not tell you who wrote it. Uh, Dan Chisester. Dan Chester. Chichester. Yeah, that's that's what I Chichester. have. Yep. Anyway, it's technically an Elseworld tale. It's not one of the best mm-hmm. crossovers, but I enjoyed no, it more as a not by a long shot. I enjoyed it more as a Daredevil comic than I did a Batman comic. So that will be that my rando sense. Batman pick. I like it. I like so. it. I like that you had one just on the spot, yeah. just rapid fire. You spit <laughs> one right out. Oh, good for you. All right. Good for you. Uh. All right. In the next week, I have to pick up my Hellblazers, my four Hellblazers. Mm-hmm. So I don't know how many Hellblazers I got to read. I am okay. listless. And I, know, I am listless in the world of Marvel Comics right now. When I yeah. I thought I was a better Marvel Comics fan slash reader than I am, mm-hmm. but without the X Men, I am just uh I'm and I'm just in an ocean with no raft. I'm I guess so. like, I'm reading the New Mutants, but they're not really the X Men. Yeah. And maybe you should go start reading some standalones, like read the whole Rogue series or something. I did. I have. That's the thing. Oh, okay. I've got. I, well, I do have. The thing is X Factor. Yeah, you know what I was thinking about doing? I was thinking about no, reading New Mutants all the way through, then going back okay. and starting with X Men One because there's oh. a lot of gaps in my original X Men run. Reading. Do you mean like Stan Lee yeah. X Men One? So starting oh, okay. there and then reading that and going into X Factor. 
yeah and mm -hmm. just like reading that team's adventures separately. that could be cool but i yeah. mean yeah it's just hard you know with no wolverines or yeah or storms or night crawlers i get i hear you i get kind of like there's enough for me to read post house of x powers of x but i'm not really feeling it <sighs> mm -hmm. there's just a lot yep. i don't know yeah you're right you are right. So maybe I'll read some early 2000s stuff that I didn't read, like Soldier X or uh, that sounds good. the Chamber miniseries. I was feeling like maybe I'd read some Star Wars comics. I know there's a Star prequel to Wars. Jedi uh, Fallen, or Fallen Order. What is it called? Fallen Order, Fallen right? Order, yeah, that's yeah. the game. Yeah, like, there's a prequel to that, like a five-issue series that I've never read before. So. so many. Thought I might read that. I also got the first volume of uh, the adaptation of Claudia Gray's Leia uh, in manga format. Mm-hmm for my birthday so i might read that. that i keep meaning to get to kirby's blue bolt and i just you know that uh, falling behind high republic book what also annoyed me is at the beginning they have a timeline of all the new books and movies mm -hmm. but they don't include any of the ya books in the timeline oh, that's there's no ahsoka or the padme books that's silly there's no like uh lost stars and it's just kind of like well what's the point then of all this yeah that's dumb that's dumb um, hmm. Yes, yeah, so you could get the Marvel app and only read Star Wars comics, and you'd be set for a very long time. You could, yeah. I was looking at some of the older ones that I might try to like cycle in a little bit Man, here Star and Wars... catch up on the catch up on the ongoing series because I kind of got away from that. Yeah. I didn't follow it as long as you did. Star Wars Legacy is maybe my favorite Star Wars thing ever. Mm -hmm. I remember that. that. Yeah, so good. Yep. Uh, anyway, yep. so that's some stuff. Yes. Well, Eric, did you know that outside of the Radio Meanwhile Network, I'm the host of How's Things, the official podcast How's and radio show things? of the David A. Howe Public Library. You can find it at soundcloud.com slash all the books. And that includes the whole All the Book Show archives that Eric and I did together and this uh, brave new era that I'm, I'm going alone on. Uh, the episode that's dropping this week is an interview with Jason Fry. We talk a lot about his Star Wars output. Mm -hmm. And tomorrow I'm interviewing author steve barnes Ooh. about his uh, sci-fi output his work with larry niven and and more that's going to be coming uh, in, in a couple couple weeks that's going to be coming out so check an eye out for that and you can always find me right here on radio meanwhile uh in 9021 here we go where we do a, a rewatch of every episode Oof. of 90210 even the terrible ones yeah i'm all caught up so i just listened to that great episode oh my gosh yeah. thank, thank yeah. you for that uh yeah, you're you know what i was telling kevin i'm like it seems like 90210 might be a bad show you know, I think, <laughs> I think what it is is they really they try to tackle very very topical issues that not even the world at large has really figured out how to deal with yet, and they're like, let's just do an episode about yeah. it and have some teenagers talk about it. But every it. now and then, you're just like, I don't know what they're doing with this character. I don't know where they're going with this, and I'm always True. just like, this doesn't seem like a well made show, a well written show. It seems like if it were, it's those actors that are carrying it. Well, that's definitely, I mean, it's definitely the actors that carry it. Okay. That's, that's for sure. Um, yeah, writing goes in and out. <laughs> um, besides this show, I also host, I co-host previously on X-Men with Hillary Gunning, where we talk yeah. X-Men comics, shows, characters, and more. We're doing a Sentinel Spotlight. Uh, I've got the whole script done, or the, all the notes. It was fun to come up with the notes, but I def I already said, I felt like the Zodiac Killer. I'm like, this, this, I didn't feel like the Zodiac Killer. I felt like I was solving it. No, you said it. I felt like I was solving it. You said you felt like him, though. Um, and also, uh, 90s music got me like, in which we're talking yep. about Blue, Dabba D by Eiffel 65 nice. this <laughs> yeah, week. Of course. So, sure. uh, learned some stuff about that song today. Okay. So that was fun. Anyway. Well, I look forward to listening. All right. Uh, we'll see you next time. Cheers.